you have designed some products that are being used by millions of people. How did you get into design? My father was not happy at all. Industrial designers are the people who specify the paint and it usually peels off, is what he said. The principles behind designing great products. What are those and, and how can non-designers apply them? What's worth designing in the first place? Excel is the enemy of design. It's not the research that matters, it's what you do with the information. How do you teach creativity? That is a very good question. Um, if you don't have design positioned in the right way in a company to, to be able to create something great, <laughs> it won't happen. Honestly, many designers have an inferiority complex. It's very important that as, as a creative person, when you're working with other organizations, that you have confidence in what you're doing because it is important. How are you thinking about uh, the impact of Gen AI on, on the, the work that you do? Our roles will change and our tools will change like they always have, but I think I'm not worried about my job. This episode is brought to you by Pendo, the all-in-one product management platform for any type of application. With Pendo, you don't have to bounce around multiple tools to figure out what's really happening inside your product. Pendo makes it easy to answer critical questions about how users are engaging with your product and then turn those insights into action. Also, you can get your users to do what you actually want them to do. Visit pendo.io slash product school to create your free account today and start building better experiences across every single corner of your product. That's pendo.io slash product school. Hey there, this is Carlos, CEO at Product School and your host on the Product Podcast. Today's guest is not your typical product management leader. I had the honor of speaking with a design visionary, Robert Bronner, the chief designer at Beats by Dr. Dre. The iconic audio brand founded in 2006 by Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine. Robert was the first design hire and worked closely with the founders to create some of the world's most popular earphones and headphones. In 2014, Beats was acquired by Apple for $3 billion. Last year alone, the company generated over $1.5 billion in annual revenue. Robert is also the founder of Ammunition, a renowned design studio based in San Francisco. His portfolio includes digital and physical product designs for iconic brands such as Ferrari, Polaroid, Square, Lyft, and Adobe. In our conversation, we delve into the design process, explore how designers can become strategic thought partners to product managers and vice versa, discuss how to enhance creativity and the impact of Gen AI on the product design process. Welcome to the show, Robert. Oh, thank you. Very happy to be here. Uh, let's start with the, the first thing, which is how did you get into design? Ah. Well, that, that's a little bit of a long story. I'll try and keep it succinct. Um, well, I, uh, you know, when I was in high school in, in California, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, average, above average student. Uh, and, you know, you get in, in California, when you get to the end of the, uh, your, your time at the high school, you meet with a guidance counselor and, you know, and he says, oh, well, you know, you're good in, in math and science. So you know, go study engineering. Right? Now, uh, and my father was a very accomplished uh, mechanical engineer. He actually uh, invented a lot of the technology in the first hard disk drives while at IBM. So I thought, okay, I'll go into engineering. You know, and I enrolled at San Jose State University. It was a, it was a decent school, it was nearby. And so I spent about a year in engineering and just, you know, early classes, but it wasn't, I wasn't connecting with it at all. It just didn't feel, um, feel right in my gut. And so my, my mother, on the other hand, was a, a fine artist and a craftsperson and an entrepreneur. She started her own children's clothing company. And so I just one day decided to go over to the art department. You know, because I thought, well, I'm, this isn't working for me. I'm going to go, go, go study art in some way. And then I, I had always um, done well in art and school and drawn on my own. And so I, I was, I walked into the art building at San Jose State and went through the door and was immediately presented with a display case full of uh, industrial design work, um, sketches, renderings, models. And I'd, know, I'd not known about industrial design. I didn't know it existed. I was interested in graphic design. I'd heard about it and it was some form of commercial art. 
And, uh, you know, I just stood there and was amazed. Like, this is, these are the things that I like to do. These are the things that I do on my own. I go in the garage and I make things and I build bicycles and, you know, these are the things that I, so, uh, I immediately changed my major to industrial design. My father was not happy at all. He, uh, I remember he said, industrial designers are the people who specify the paint and it usually peels off. That's what he said. And so, uh, but he, you know, he used to, he was unhappy because he liked helping me with my calculus homework and things But he, uh, he, he, he turned around eventually. Um, but so that, that was that, and, and it actually made a lot of sense in, in retrospect and the things that I, you know, the thing that was, that's sort of an indictment of the school system is that they, they didn't really look at you know, how well I had done in art and shop class and things like that. Those, those don't really count, you know, from, from a career perspective in, in, in this institutional mind, it was really about, you know, looking at the core math, science, liberal arts, et cetera. So anyway, uh, that's, that's how I stumbled onto industrial design and, and never looked back. I think I had at that, after that, uh, an A in every class I took and just, um, would stay up all night working on it. And, you know, that's, that's how I knew that it was for me because, you know, it was, it, it didn't seem like work. It just, it seemed like fun. Well, you have designed some products that are being used by millions of people. Mm -hmm. So, uh, hope also some, some family members uh, included. So mm -hmm. I know you gave two talks at ProductCon, our conference, both in San Francisco and New York around the principles behind designing great products. And obviously our audience are mostly product leaders and maybe they don't come from a design background. So if you were to summarize those, those principles, like what, what is, what are those and, and how can non-designers ap apply them? Yeah, well, it's, it's a fairly, well, it's an interesting thing because I, I started looking at this idea of, you know, I've, I've worked on a lot of things, right, over, over my career. And, you know, in sort of this thing that, you know, and, and most of the things that I've worked on and my company works on turn out good, right? It's good design. And that's the, you know, in fact, almost everything we do. And, and so I look, you know, but I started asking this question, there, there's these number of things, you know, maybe 15, 20% that are great, that turn out really amazing and have a huge impact. And, and why is that? Right. What, what is it? Right. So, you know, if you look at good design and, you know, I would describe good design as doing the job well, right. It, it does what it's supposed to do. It's, it's usable, right. It's useful. Um, it's desirable. People want it. It's attractive, functional. Uh, it's competitive in the marketplace. It's manufacturable. It's attainable to people. They can afford it, right? It's at the good price. And, you know, all those things that make it good, you know, the, the, the things that you need are, you know, understanding the opportunity, right? You, you need the talent to, to be able to execute on that. Um, The, the proper tools, the proper process, the right experience, right? Those are all things that you need, right? To do a, a to, to focus, to have good design. And, and that's important. That's really a, you know, a foundational thing that, you know, when you're approaching the design of something, anything, but especially a product. But when you, when you look at, when I began to look at what made the really great things, the sort of things that happened were, were very different above that. Right. It's, you know, when I, when I think about great design, it's something that, you know, moves the needle, that creates change, that really, you know, whether that's change in society, change in the market, change in behavior or something, right? You know, th those things are inspiring, right? They inspire people, they're empowering, right? They give people the ability to do something they haven't done before. And, and many times they're transformative and that could be transforming someone's life, transforming someone's day, transforming someone's outlook, or you know, transforming a market, a company, right? That they create this sort of change. And when I started to look into that, what, what are they doing? Well, they're challenging norms, right? They're, they're challenging what people expect or what, what, what the average is, or, you know, again, what, what good is, right? Um, 
they tend to be culturally relevant. They, they, they fit into a time and space in society and, and, and really make an impact. Um, you know, they tend to be a portal to something bigger. There's the product itself, the object and what it does, but many times it's extend, extended into a service and it does something that's even bigger than that. Um, they tend, tend to be socially positive. You know, they're creating uh, positive change and, and, and value. They, they're creating value in the world and, and high value beyond, you know, they're, they're, you know, single products that have, created enormous economic value or enormous social value, right? That it created the change. So th those are the things that I, you know, I began to say that that's what great is about, right? And so what it takes to achieve that, though, is a different set. You know, if you remember before I was talking about opportunity, tools, process, et cetera. Well, what great requires is a worldview, right? You need to look at the bigger picture and understand the world around you and this product and society. Um, it requires a lot of empathy. Right? You to do great design, you have to really put yourself in the lives of others and really understand what that means and, and how something will create this positive change. Uh, you it requires a clarity in, in vision and commitment and tenacity, you know, these are things that, you know, when I looked at these projects, there was always this leadership, right? And, and not just the leadership that I or my team would provide, but the leadership with the people we were working with or partnering with, right? There is usually one or two people, maybe a small group that had this, this clarity and commitment and tenacity to make something great. It really was sort of like, we're going to make this great. That's, that's you know, the, the secret to making something great is really being committed to it. And then, and then this thing that's really interesting that um, I came fascinated with this idea of fluid intelligence. That is your, your ability to um, be able to very effectively morph and, and understand and move around a problem and, and do it in a very, solve it in a very fluid kind of way, you know, instead of being very rigid, this is the only way you do it. And so, you know, those are the things that make great. And it's not, it's, it's a complex thing, right? It's not simple, but I always, I, I boil it down to, you know, leadership, really leadership that you, you know, that, that happens at a variety of levels. So, so getting back to your question about product management, I think, you know, there, there is part of developing and delivering something. There, there needs to be these higher level goals, right, of, 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 of creating impact and, and understanding what that is. And it's not something you can entirely build into process, but it is important that you everyone's sort of clear on this sort of goal of what they're building. And, and I, what I find problematic is that many times the efforts of program and project management are are entirely focused around delivery you know within a certain time period within a framework right and of course that's you know but it's but it, that, that actually can limit things yeah and that's one of the challenges that i also notice with design teams they tend to be under a product team Right. It's very rare to see a chief designer. Uh, you see, typically see a chief product officer and a chief product officer oversees product management, design. So typically the highest ranked person in design is, is the VP of design. So curious to, to learn more about the rationale behind uh, Beats to have a chief designer at the, at the C-suite. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. Uh, so that was, you know, when I, I helped start Beats almost, she's, 18 years ago, right? That I've been working at, with the brand since then, you know, in my capacity as the founder of Ammunition, but, you know, it just, I was there at the very beginning with Jimmy and Dre. And to them, design was very important, especially Jimmy really understood this idea that, you know, he had, he had worked with Steve Jobs. He understood how important the physical embodiment of an idea was. And, and the iconography that you can create with design. So, you know, we, we, we launched the company, we did a series of projects, the company was growing. And, you know, the idea of chief designer wasn't so much, 
you know, a specific title fitting in a framework, right? I was, you know, reporting to Jimmy at the time, who was CEO and, and Luke Wood, who was president, and a very direct relationship. And, and that's something that I found to be very important in all the work that we do is sort of really working with the individuals who are really driving the enterprise, right? It, it, and really, so, so, you know, the notion of, well, what am I, you know, it didn't make sense that I was a VP. It didn't make sense that, you know, it, it was more that you're, you're, you're in charge of design. You're, you're making things, right? You're, you're, you need to have the ability to drive this idea through not just the company, but the partners they work with. And so that was the notion of, of chief design, right? Chief designer. It's not chief design officer in that I wasn't part of the C-suite. There's, that's a different title, you know, that, that, that occasionally occurs, um, you know, because I was not actually an employee of the company, but, but the idea of that, you know, that, you know, beyond a vice president or beyond, it was, wasn't so much around that. It was more about what are you doing? Right. And, and what are we empowering you to do? And that, that was the notion of it, of it, having a chief designer. And I think it's, you know, in a, it, titles, you know, matter within a corporation, but in some ways they don't, right? You can have a title and, you know, still not be effective. It's really, um, it's really about outside of the individual, what are you saying about the role of design, right? And that, that's what I think becomes very important because design, you know, especially creative design within organizations is very easy to um, place misplace that because it's not always understood right and and so if you're not if you don't have design position in the right way in a company to to be able to really effectively create something great it won't happen so you know recognizing supporting and positioning the idea of design within it within a um, corporate or social structure is, is really important and so giving it that weight that it needs is, is I think, very important. And I agree. Like, it's not always well understood. And I think this is the question I'm going to ask you come from two ways. One is from the, the product perspective. Like, how can a product manager who doesn't come from a design background can develop more empathy and appreciation for the value or the business value that a design team can bring? Yeah. Well, you know, there, there are a number of things. I think the first most basic thing that any product manager can do is really educate themselves on the design process. You know, that there, you know, there is an aspect, you know, of sort of there's the the path that you follow and the the deliverables and the benchmark and all these things you line up on a, you know, Gantt chart to create a schedule. Right. Um, but you need to get beyond that and understand, you know, what is important about each area and what is important that occurs you know for example you know in in the research phase right what is it that designers need to uncover you know or the data that they need to to start to build a framework for the product and figure out what's worth designing in the concept phase you know what is what is the appropriate amount of time and when do you know when you're done Right. Because just because you say, OK, you've got eight weeks to develop a concept. You can follow that path and not be there or not have uncovered the right thing. So it's it's also just understanding, right, when when is it that we have a design concept and what does that mean and what does that look like? Right. And then as you get into development, into engineering development, what is it that needs to happen to maintain that design concept? Right. Just really begin to understand the process from a from a design perspective so that you know that can be better um better supported and understood so that that's something that that's that's very important uh, also just knowing how to communicate with designers that's you know it's really interesting i when i um first started at apple um i re i realized that much of the design team didn't know how to really communicate with engineering and, and marketing, right? They didn't speak the language. They spoke their own language, right, of, 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 of design. So I spent a time saying, look, you need to contextualize this in a language that people understand, not just say this, you know, speak in superlatives and adjectives. And, you know, it's, it's so, but, but it goes both ways. I think as, as from a development point of view, understanding 
the language of design and what people mean when they talk about a concept and talk about its in integrity and and talk about um, its impact, all these things that, you know, it's, 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 it's sort of building bridges, you know, with, with different cultures and organizations. Yeah, that was going to be my, my other question. It, it goes both ways. So it's also important for the designers in this case to, to learn how to speak that business language and somehow yeah. better quantify or explain the business outcomes here, right? In a world driven mm -hmm. by OKRs and tight deadlines and budgets, um, be curious if you found specific examples on how design can be better um, explained to a non-designer so it can be truly prioritized yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very important. I think that, um, you know, there is, there, there's also a challenge with designers that, um, honestly, many designers have an inferiority complex, right? They, you know, because they, they're doing a creative enterprise, they went to art school, you know, they're working with, with MBAs and people with doctorates in engineering. There's sort of this, you know, oh, I'm just a, I'm just a little artist. You know, what do I know? And that can be really, really detrimental. I think it's 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 very important that as as a creative person, when you're working with other organizations, that you have confidence in what you're doing because it is important. And 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 because that energy, you know, as you're working with a team is very important. If you if you feel subservient, you will be subservient. If you feel like you're a partner and an important part of the process, you will become an important part of the process. It's really a sort of self-determination thing. So, I, I, you know, I, a lot of times I just, I, I found early in my career where, you know, I, um, you know, I just did things and said things I wasn't necessarily supposed to, you know, but, you know, what that did was that that created um, confidence and trust in me as an individual with, with other organizations, right? And and so I think it's really important for designers to to, get the tools they need to know how to communicate and feel, feel very confident in the value of their work uh, because that that in itself you know it is a path towards doing great design yeah and there's another group of individuals that are very involved in in design and product the, the researchers right and i know that that you have a hot take on on the intersection between research and and design like how, how do you think about that well, I think research is important. I think it's sometimes, you know, it, I, you know, I, I used to joke, you know, and really I would say this to get a reaction was that, you know, if there, if great design was born in research, there'd be a lot more great design, right? Because, you know, researching something and, and gaining data is almost something anyone can do, right? It's, it's not, it's not the, research that matters. It's what you do with the information <laughs> and what you learn from it and what you choose not to use, right? These are very important things, right? Because you can go out and research something and find out what people believe or what is going on today. But what you're really talking about is doing something that will be out in two years and really something that will in many ways, you want to focus on where people are going five years from now, right? So, you know, again, it's it's not, I think research is very important. We do a fair amount of research. It's, you know, we, we've characterized it by this, this question, you know, that we use to guide our early work, which is um, what's worth designing in the first place, right? Because, you know, to design and develop and deliver a product is a very expensive enterprise. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of people. It takes a lot of natural resources. It does, you know, so you really should understand before you dive into something, what is really worth designing, right? And so the answer to that question has a lot of levels about, um, you know, market value, impact to people, impact to society, you know, all these things, you start to ask these questions, right? What is, what is really worth spending five, 10, $50 million on? What is really worth taking two, three, four years to develop? What is really worth, you know, using, you know, an incredible amount of natural resource. And it causes you to really focus on understanding the framework for success, right? And, and I think in many ways, that's, that's how, from a design point of view, I think research is incredibly important, is, is uncovering 
things that can lead to success and lead to impact. And again, so it's not so much about just researching per se, it's about gaining the information and figuring out what to do with it. This episode is brought to you by Evo, the next generation A-B testing and feature management platform built for modern growth teams by alums from Airbnb and Stitch Fix. With Evo, you can increase experimentation velocity while unlocking rigorous deep analysis. From setup to troubleshooting to analysis, Epo makes experimentation easy. An accessible UI makes it easy to dig into performance. An out-of-the-box reporting makes it easy for you to avoid annoying prolonged analytics cycles. Check out why companies like Twitch, Miro, and DraftKings rely on Epo. Visit getepo.com slash product school and 10x your experiment velocity. That's getepo.com slash product school. Uh, creativity is a word that comes to mind as I think about design and kind of the the and a structured part of the, the process, if you will. How do you teach creativity? <laughs> that is a very good question. Um, you know, the, the, there's, you can and you can't, right? There's, I think there's things that you follow to support creativity in, in approaches and processes. <clears throat> and honestly, some people just aren't creative. Some people have a difficult time um, in visualizing something that's not there, right? Uh, they really want to be rooted in the here and now or the past. And that, that's, very, that's very common. So, you know, I think what in teaching creativity, you're, you're really teaching people to um, let go of bias, let go of um, convention, let go of all these things that hold you back and allow yourself to look at something openly and freely and, and then be willing to tend time, spend time to explore those things and iterate on them and play with them, right? It's something that, you know, I think is really important that, and this goes back to um, product management. Um, design needs time to explore and play and fail, right? That's failure is something that people don't like to hear. It, it's, a, it's a word that scares people. Um, you know, I often say, you know, one of my things I love to say is risk is not a four letter word, right? Because risk is something you have to take to be to innovate and you have to be willing to have failures. Now, you know, you don't want to have big mac macro failures, right? The micro failures are the ones you're looking for where you try something and maybe it didn't work out, but you learned something. And that is a big part of creativity is being able to experiment and play and and have a mind that supports that idea. And it's something... I found to be really important in our studio is that people feel safe, right? And, you know, safety is a really interesting word. It's in some ways misunderstood because it sounds sort of boring and conservative and, oh, making things safe. But it is, safety is a foundation of self-expression. You know, when you feel safe, you can be who you are. And I find that with design, you know, creating an environment where people feel safe to play, feel safe to experiment, feel safe to take risks, feel safe to, you know, and know that, okay, if this blows up in my face, I'm not going to lose my job. You know, maybe if it happens over and over, but not, you know, not in one particular situation. So, so I think those, those are all very important things to creativity that not, aren't really understood. And it, it's something that it can be learned, but many times it also just comes from an internal impetus where, you know, I have things, you know, I, I have this sort of notion that if you're really good at design, in many ways, you're able to literally project yourself in the future and come back, right? It's sort of, if, if you start to understand, um, I won't get too far into this, but if you start to understand how quantum theory works in time, you know, there are different time channels happening at the same time. And, and I think in, in many ways, a really good designer is able to project forward and come back and have the openness to, to, to think that way. And so we, you know, it's something that I'm always very, um, you know, and it comes back to the research, which, you know, when we collected data about today, said, look at you, okay, that's great. We understand what's going on today. What's gonna happen two, five, 10 years from now, right? What are, what are, where do we think that's going to be? And, and has start to understand those ideas and, and, and put that in as an influence in our work. And it's, 
it's I think what allows you to keep moving forward and stay very creative. So how do you connect that now with the process? I'm really curious to know what is your design process and, and how you actually work with so many different brands as, as part of your studio. Yeah, it's it's important because, I mean, I, I've said this recently that, uh, you know, in many ways, um, we're we're paid to execute excellence, right? It's It's not just being excellent. You have to be able to execute that on that. Because ultimately what we do has to get out into the world, you know, to be effective, to create uh, economic value, create the change I talked about earlier. So you have to be focused on what does it take to actually deliver. And and that's what I find with a lot of organizations is they, is they may be very good at creating and coming up with new ideas, but don't have the discipline or understanding to actually deliver that in a way that can get out into the world. And there's so many things in that word, world, word deliver. It's not just about time, not just about cost. It's about resources. It's about understanding the process. It's about understanding the culture of an organization, all these things. So, you know, getting back to your question, it's, it's very important that a designer and a product manager understand you know, of course, the, the time frame that they're working in and what they need to do to be effective and to get this thing out into the world and constantly monitor that through the development process. Now, the one thing that I think people have to embody and get comfortable with is things are not always linear. Right? And in many ways, they shouldn't be. You would like it to be linear. You would like it to fo follow the Gantt chart. But many times aren't. So you have to sort of build in the ability to be nonlinear and, you know, and allow for discovery. And when discovery is made, allow for a change in course and always keeping an eye on where you need to be at a certain point in time. But, you know, ultimately, to some degree, you know, the content of the work should be more important than the timing, right? Of course, if you've if you have a market window where you have to deliver this thing in 18 months and you say it's going to take four years, that's a big decision. But, you know, if if taking an extra four months or three months or whatever it takes, you know, to and on to something that is much more valuable, then you have to be willing to um, support, communicate and, and at least explore that path. Right. So I think it is um, embracing the idea of. Um, not linearity. It's actually one of the things I think is as as a human being in life, you know, and being happy is to be comfortable with the concept of uncertainty. Right. If, Absolutely. if you and, and, oh, go ahead, please. No, no. I, I was just going to say that I resonate with that because that's a major difference between project managers and product managers. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people misunderstand as product managers, glorified project managers, and that's not the case at all. Like we are also driven by outcomes, and we also try to stay flexible as understand that sometimes it's just really hard to put everything on a roadmap, and a roadmap is not just a timeline. And there's a lot of discovery that goes as you build. No, it's true. It's true. And some of the more difficult relationships with product managers I've had have, have not been having a lack of flexibility, or as I said, uh, uh, not being comfortable with uncertainty. They want everything locked down now, right? And as opposed to, well, let's let's agree on how we're aligned and where we want to get to and work together throughout the process to get there. And, uh, you know, so I think that that concept as a product manager is really important. You know, again, you have a job to do. You have to. You have responsibilities. You have, you know, people above you who have, who have requirements. Those are important. But being comfortable with, you know, the path being nonlinear and uncertain, and managing that, I think, is one of the important things that makes a, a great product manager. So now, I'm asking you as a CEO, uh, sometimes when people come to me. If could be a designer, it could be a product manager, it could be someone else asking for an adjustment to the original plan. There are two things that work very well. One is when they scare me or when they make me greedy, right? Like if we don't do this, we're going to die. Or if you wait, this is going to be extremely amazing. So I'm, I'm curious to know as a, as a designer, or especially now what's a founder of your own studio, when you work with different brands and you come back with, you know, 
a, a suggestion based on new findings, what are some good ways to, to get alignment? Uh, well, I, I tend to focus more on the on the greedy side, right? As, as you know, there, there's an opportunity here that's important. And but then do it in a way that, you know, people can. I, I mean, I don't really want to scare somebody, right? Because e even, you know, you present someone with an opportunity, they can get scared, right? It's all of a sudden, oh, no, this is something new. This is something different. This is something we haven't tested. So it's it's really, you know, creating the 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 framework for this is a big opportunity and this is how we're going to do it right <laughs> and and this is what we'll do to make sure it works um, you know once in a while the, the the fear thing comes along where you know there there is there's bad decision making happening and you just have to say look if you do that we're gonna we're gonna fail this product is just not gonna not gonna be successful and here's why you know you have to do that sometimes because You know, that the, there can be a lot of dumb decision making that's, again, based on some very uh, micro thing. I used to I used to joke that, um, you know, Excel is the enemy of design. Right. <laughs> you know, because any good any good analyst could put together a, a spreadsheet that would show, okay over the life of this product, if you if you do this now, it's going to cost, you know, 10 million dollars, you know, and. But instead of if you do this now, it's going to create a hundred million dollars of opportunity, right? So, you know, it's you know it it's very um, I think it, it it's very important that you you walk the line of both. That again, if there's some dumb you know if people are making a dumb decision and it's going to create a product that will fail, you have to make sure they understand that and why. But if you if you've uncovered an opportunity that means a change in course that's going to cause you know, some, some discomfort because there's, again, some uncertainty or unknown there. You have to sort of say, okay, this is how we're going to do it. And this is how we're going to understand it. And this is what it's going to cost, et cetera. And let's, let's go. And I think it's, it's, it is an important thing though, to understand. And we have to talk about AI, otherwise it wouldn't mm -hmm. be a, a good podcast. Uh, okay. How are you thinking about uh, the impact of Gen AI on, on the, the work that you do? <laughs> Uh, well, that, that's the, yeah, I get asked that a lot and it's, it's an interesting one. And, and I, I have this, um, viewpoint that is probably, is becoming rare that, and, and I'm going to date myself, but I, I've been doing this for over 40 years, right? And, uh, and I'm not going to pull the, um, you know, when I was a young designer, blah, blah, blah stuff. It's just what I've seen is, you know, many, many changes in how we work based on tools and technology, right? One of the first products I designed, the only automation I had was a HP calculator, right? Um, I used pencils, pens, a drafting machine, you know, it, it was, that was it. And, and, and yet the work was good, right? And it was successful and it won awards and everything. Right? And then I look at what we do today and I've seen, you know, first it was, 2D CAD, then 3D CAD, then advanced surfacing, then visualization techniques, 3D printing, you know, um, and then now to, you know, generative AI. And, and every time what has happened is that you know, on, a, on a high level that what it's done is take, give, give people more time to think and more time to be creative, right? When I was back, you know, crunching numbers on my calculator, I, I had to put an enormous amount of time to do that. You know, and then all of a sudden that that burden was lifted as soon as CAD came into play. Right. And as soon as, you know, 3D servicing came into play, the, you know, the, the ability to describe geometry became much more simple. Right. All these things started, you know, basically taking the burden of calculation, the burden of work off designers to allow, effectively allow them to do more. Same thing with 3D printing. Right. We used to spend while I still think it's important that people build models themselves with their own hands. The iterative process of using 3D printing, again, takes a lot of time to, that we used to have to do that by hand or, or less or lesser degrees of automation. And, and now it does. So, so when I look at generative AI right now, the same thing is happening, right? It's, you know, it, it's a simple example. In, in our studio over the last, you know, 10 years, we built an incredible skill in Photoshop, right? That we could create mashups of, of CAD renderings and photographs that people could not tell they weren't real. So it, it allowed us to 
um, you know, present ideas in context and be very powerful. Um, all that is all that work is now being taken over by by Firefly and some other things, right? So we don't need to invest as much time in that, right? It, it, and and so that's you know starting to occur. You know the um, we're we're using um, ChatGPT and others for you know exploring concepts or automating research. You know we're we're doing you know if, if I look at the the tools that we you know are are using right now. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's really around, you know, increased automation and research. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're using Gen AI for more speed and accuracy in, in creative and technical efforts. Um, we're starting to use, you know, a, some concept creation, but it's really an augmentation. You know, the, the, the challenge with the tools that we're using right now is there, there's not enough control, right? So, you, so it, we almost use it as an adjunct to brainstorming, you know, and, and then what, what's starting to happen and will continue to happen is more automation in development and, and refinement, right? You know, so what, what I think really is happening it's sort of the designer's role and what will continue to accelerate is you're, you're moving towards this idea of, you know, producer, director, and editor, right? It's, it's, um, you know, being more time to really think about the product itself and, and focus on produce it, you know, being, you being very skilled at directing and editing. Right. Um, but, but I, you know, the big question that's out there, right. That I think more, many people are afraid of is that this notion that, you know, am I going to be out of a job, right? Is generative AI going to allow companies to use, use tools to actually create designs for products and, and, and use them to deliver in the world and sort of take the human element completely out of it? And, and, I, and I think some of that will happen, but, but I, you know, and this is where I have this sort of you know, go back on this 40 year history in that I think, you know, there's something about design that is a decidedly human thing. The, the, the idea of, of, of creation of things. Um, there is a very unique relationship people have with things, objects in their lives. That's entirely emotional, right? You know, we, we in many ways define who we are to the things we possess or the things we wear, or the things we drive and the things we live in or sit on, right? We, we, we those are things that ex they're expressions. And, and what I find very consistent is that people like to feel connected to other people through design. They the feeling that connection that someone has created something and delivered it into my life to improve my life, right? is is a very uh, is, is a very special and unique thing that i i don't think that it it will be replaced by by gen ai right i think there always will be a human role in successful design and development and it's you know i you know i i'll tell you a quick story which i i think is is important so um uh one of my good friends uh graphic designer named paula share she's uh very very famous graphic designer works at Pentagram and I was at Pentagram. And when I was at Pentagram, um, we were working with, with, um, Citibank at that time it was city city financial was merging with, um, Citibank was merging with travelers and she was hired to develop the identity. And I was working on some of the software aspects of it. And in the first meeting we had Paula sketched out the logo. Right, which was integrating the traveler's umbrella with the city logo. And then, you know, went away for a month and came back and presented that single idea. Right. And the people, the client was sort of like, well, wait a minute, you know, we saw you sketch that in the first meeting and we're paying you all this money and you come back with that one idea. And, and Paula, I wish I could throw a rant like Paula did, but does, but she said, you're not buying my time. You're buying every movie I've ever seen. You're buying every painting I have ever created. You're buying every building that I've ever been in. You're buying every experience that I've had up to this point in my life to 
come and shape what, I, what you, you know, who you're going to be, right? And, you know, and while you could say that, of course, you could write software that would go out and, you know, just find all this information and pull it back together in a way that would support a design. That's, that's certainly possible and probably will happen. But I don't, I just have this strong belief that, 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 that um, et emotional editorial that designers have and that emotional framework that they put together to deliver something that, that connects with people will always exist. And our roles will change and our tools will change like they always have. But I think I'm not worried about my job. That's a great way to put it. And I, and I, I've seen the same with, with product people. They, they would ask me, hey, what, what is the impact that this would have on, on someone's career? And I, I, I also agree. I don't think AI is what's replacing existing PMs. In, the, in my case, I think AI PMs or PMs that understand how to leverage AI are the ones who are replacing the ones who do not embrace this type of uh, opportunity to augment their impact. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. But Robert, it's been a pleasure to spend oh. this time with you, learn more about your own experience. And thank you for bringing more light into what it takes to build great products from a design standpoint. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. <laughs>